Okay, so let's start articular cartilage. So we'll talk about the structure of articular cartilage, the pathophysiology of disease. I'll look at biochemical Im imaging, then anatomic imaging, and then we'll talk a little bit about treatment of cartilage problems. Now, there, there are a number of different descriptions of different layers of the articular cartilage. In reality, it's a continuum from the calcified portion where it attaches to the bone up to the surface. Uh, on the surface, the cartilaginous fibers are located horizontal to the surface. In the middle, they're randomly oriented. And in the deep fibers are perpendicularly oriented with respect to the surface where they attach directly into the bone, uh, perpendicularly into the bone. Uh, other people talk about superficial, middle, deep, and calcified layers. And uh, histologically, you can see a number of different layers, but again, it's kind of a gradual process. And I kind of like the, the model uh, that's in, uh, this is one of our old textbooks back in 2006 uh, from Dr. Aw. Uh, nice diagram here where it shows the type 1 collagen fibers. They come up to the surface, and you can see where they're mostly horizontal at the surface because they fold over at the surface. Then they dive down where they're kind of randomly oriented, and then they stick in, the ends stick into the calcified bone deep below it. And then two other important aspects of cartilage is hyaluronic acid, which is this long uh, string-like structure here and it intertwines in between the type 1 collagen fibers, and then these bottle brush type structures attach to the, uh, uh, to the hyaluronic acid, and, that, and the hyaluronic acid then holds these bottle brush uh, uh, structures into the, inside the fibers within the, uh, uh, the, the, the collagen fibers within the cartilage. And then you can see at the end of these little bottle brushes, uh, water molecules, H2O, attaches to it. So uh, these glucosaminoglycans, uh, uh, which attach to the hyaluronic acid, actually absorb in water. And we'll see how that's going to be uh, important. Also notice that the structure is a little bit kind of uh, spongy. And actually it's designed so that if you compress it, the collagen fibers will compress down. The hyaluronic acid and glucosaminoglycans will go down with the, with the uh, uh, type 1 collagen fibers, and water then will be uh, uh, let go and will go into the, uh, uh, to the joint fluid. And then when you release the pressure, everything pops up again, and water these water molecules are sucked back in to attach to the glucosaminoglycans. And that's critically important for the normal physiology of articular cartilage uh, uh, that, that, that happens. Uh, and that's because, as we'll see in a minute, and we'll go over it in more detail later, uh, that the diffusion of, of, uh, of molecules into the cartilage is a very slow process if you don't have this pumping mechanism by compressing and releasing the articular cartilage. And within the, what's not shown here, within the collagen fibers here are chondrocytes, which uh, create the biochemical elements here that are important uh, for maintaining the uh, structure of the, uh, the cartilage. And if you don't have pressure and compression of the cartilage, that diffusion is very slow, and you really get to uh, malnutrition of the chondrocytes. I think this may be a major reason why a lot of older individuals uh, <clears throat> or middle-aged individuals uh, who aren't very active and sit around all day long tend to get accelerated degenerative disease and cartilage loss within their joints, especially their knee joints, because the cartilage needs this uh, compression expansion syndrome to actually get adequate nutrient supply from the joint fluid into the articular cartilage. So it's the old use it or lose it kind of situation. 
This is just kind of a higher diagram showing the chondroitin sulfate and the keratin sulfate, part of the glucosaminoglycans, uh, which attach to the hyaluronic acid uh, here. And then these are what absorb the water molecules. And then when you compress it, they, they're released. And then when you decompress it, the water comes back in along with other nutrients that are in the uh, articular cartilage. So this is just another diagram from Deb Bernstein from Harvard, showing that inside this, you also have cells uh, which uh, create the biochemistry that makes cartilage function properly. And these are the glucosaminoglycans and then the collagen and the cells, the major elements here. Uh, we don't need to go into that detail. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how this functions. Uh, this was a study done by an MR in the very early days of MR, as you can see here, where they took a basically a bar, pressed it against a, a cow's uh, uh, patella articular cartilage. And what you see here on this T1-weighted image is where the cylinder presses against the articular cartilage, it becomes thinner than it is over here. And if you notice, you've got these areas that are kind of swollen on either side of the bar that are dark. Uh, they're dark because it predominantly is, it has high water content, which is low on T1-weighted images. And you can see how the water is being redistributed within the articular cartilage here. What this does is it increases the surface area where there's contact between this object that's is pressing on the cartilage and the cartilage itself. If you have the same pressure and you double the contact area, the, I mean, if you have the same force and you double the contact area, you decrease the pressure by 50%. So this redistribution, redistribution of the water within the, the uh, articular cartilage uh, has two functions. One, it, it helps this pumping mechanism to bring nutrients to the chondrocytes within the cartilage. It also increases the, the surface area, smooths out the contact, uh, which then overall uh, causes you not to have focal areas of high pressure on the cartilage and therefore is protective to the cartilage. Histologically, this is what cartilage looks like. Uh, here's the superficial layer. Uh, here's the deep layer. The superficial layer tends to have a higher water content in it uh, and has a little different uh, density here on, on this. Uh, uh, this is a photomicrograph. Uh, and then here we can see where the surface is eroded away, like you get with grade 2 chondromalacia. You can see you lose that superficial surface, uh, and then you can get deeper, more closer to grade three here. On MR scan on these T1-weighted images from very early on in the MR days, you can see the low signal of the surface area uh, due to its high water content, increased signal in the deeper layers due to more uh, proteoglycans and uh, less water uh, in the deeper fibers. So we've looked at, or a lot of people have looked at uh, how to evaluate the cartilage uh, clinically using MR. Many different pulse sequences have been used uh, over the years. Uh, I'm going to limit it to, to just a few of these. Uh, the main factors that you need in evaluating articular cartilage is high resolution and high contrast for things that you want to see. So this actually is a bovine articular cartilage, or no, horse articular cartilage. Uh, that we did when uh, we did some imaging of uh, horses or uh, horse cadavers uh, in Santa Barbara when I when I was in Santa Barbara. Uh, these are, uh, we were able to get high resolutions even though this was 1989 and 1990 we, because we put a single one centimeter coil over the, the, the articular cartilage and then we were able to image with high resolution and because we had a very local coil, we could get very good signal to noise on a 1.5T system. This is a proton density uh, uh, image here. This is the, the image acquired at the same time, but with T2 weighting using the old double echo technique, which uh, we no longer use. Uh, you can see the normal undulation of the surface. So with MR, if we actually had good signal to noise and do high resolution imaging, you can actually see the normal undulation of the articular cartilage. On the uh, proton density image, we can see that there's difference in signal here uh, with more inhomogeneous in the deeper layers. 
on this traditional uh, T2-weighted image. You can see the surface has a much higher water content and is very bright. The deeper surfaces is lower in signal intensity. It's lower in signal intensity here primarily because of the dephasing due to the random orientation of the collagen fibers and the deep part of the articular cartilage. And then here, this is the calcified layer here, and then we can see the trabecular bone uh, deep to that. So, so what we need is good biochemical contrast and high 3D spatial resolution. So let me just go through kind of rapidly uh, some different techniques. Here's a spinaco technique. I won't go through the details. Here with this regular uh, uh, Spinaco T2-weighted image, you can see the surface of the articular cord is very nicely compared to the fluid within the joint space. You can see higher signal intensity on the surface, lower signal intensity when you get down to the dense collagen fibers and the deep calcified layer. Uh, if you do fat suppression on this, uh, you can still see a lot of the structures. You lose a lot of the fine contrast within the articular cartilage, and then you lose a lot of signal to noise because you get a lot of signal with the, with the fat that you're suppressing here. If we go to a lower TE, more of a proton density fat suppressed sequence, uh, we can get something like this. But again, with fat suppression, you do lose signal to noise. Uh, uh, here is a, another PD technique a year or two later where we have a better signal uh, intensity. You can also use stir imaging. Uh, we can get fairly good contrast, but typically with stir imaging, we don't really see the details of the articular cartilage as well, uh, <clears throat> but you can often get very good contrast between the water and the other structures. Here we can see a full thickness grade four uh, defect with underlying bone marrow edema. Uh, there's a, there's other techniques that have that have been looked at, some of which are 3D, uh, uh, but I'll come to the one we typically use. So this this is really a viper technique. I, I'm not going to go through the details of that because we that would be in the physics section. Uh, 3D gradient echo. Neither of these do we use anymore. A T2 fat suppress, which a lot of people like. I'm not a big fan of T2 fat suppression. Uh, you can get enhanced contrast between fluid and the articular cartilage, but I think we can do that perfectly clinically viable with its PD fat suppressed technique. And if we have a shorter TE, we get much better signal to noise. So you notice our sequences are all PD fat suppressed, not T2 fat suppressed. And then you can just have straight PD without fat suppression, uh, as we see here. Okay, 20-year-old male with a twisting injury. Here we can see an acute... Uh, a tear of the articular cartilage with a displaced fragment and through here an underlying trabecular bone injury, uh, injury there. Uh, <clears throat> this is a T2 fast, T2 fast, uh, fast spin echo uh, PD technique here. Uh, this is a cube, a 3D technique. If you're really interested in doing good articular cartilage imaging, I think you really do need a 3D technique. For a long time, we used to do 3D T2-weighted imaging of the knee. It's more time consuming. The signal to noise isn't quite as good. And we pretty much found for most clinical purposes, outside of research purposes, a 2D technique is faster, uh, easier, to, easier to read. And so uh, most of our sequences for most of our centers are 2D techniques. So though a few of our centers uh, have some software where we still do 3D imaging. But there you can see the defect in the cartilage. Okay, you could also use arthrography, which uh, I don't recommend, uh, but some people like to do it. And here we can see the signal on a T1-weighted image with contrast going into the flap tear of the articular cartilage. Uh, one thing when you measure these, and typically if you have full thickness defects that are focal like this, it's important to measure them because the size of the lesion is an important factor in what surgery is done at the time. We, I think we had a talk about that uh, from the curling job earlier in the year. Uh, the important thing here is to realize that the surgeon, what the surgeon wants to know is what's going to be the size of the defect after they resect all the unstable fragments which typically, typically it's difficult, especially in adults, to get this cartilage to 
reconnect to the bone. So typically you have to resect it and therefore what's important is to measure one extreme margin of the lesion to the other extreme margin because after they debreed the area, uh, these edges of the uh, abnormal cartilage are going to be removed and their, their measurements that they need to determine what kind of surgical procedure is after they've debrided the area. And I think a lot of, there are a lot of discrepancies in the literature where MR uh, tends to underestimate the size of the lesion compared to arthroscopy. And I think that's because most of the radiologists have been measuring a different measure of the size than the uh, orthopedic surgeon. Remember, it's after they've debrided when they measure it. Okay, I don't remember who's next. Anybody not? Okay, Ellie, why don't you go, go for it? Okay, so the question of articular cartilage defect. Uh, yeah, in the, the, where are we here? Is it the, the medial compartment? Yeah, in the along the femoral condyle, there's uh, maybe a defect of the cartilage with some subchondral edema. Okay, so this is the T1, and this is the PD fat set. Uh, we go to the sagittal plane. This is back when I used a different technique. Here's a T1, and here's T2. And so I guess the question is, uh, is the articular cartilage intact here or not? Mm, I don't think so. I mean, on the PD fats, it looks... We were concerned. Notice on this T2-weighted image, the contrast was way too dense, okay. and therefore it was low in signal intensity. So we actually brought the patient back a uh, two days later uh, with no uh, arthrographic injection, and we could see the cartilage is intact. Uh, so one thing that I, I think it's important for people to realize in this seems to be under-recognized in both the radiology and the orthopedic community, is remember, if you have traumatic injury to the bone, cartilage is very flexible. And so you can uh, impact the cartilage, and the cartilage will absorb the impaction, maybe uh, get a little accelerated diffusion uh, due to uh, the mechanism we talked about earlier. But the bone underlying it is very rigid. And if you have a certain amount of impaction that's directly perpendicular to the bone, you can fracture the subchondral bone, but the overlying cartilage can stay intact. Now, what typically happens if you have a significant injury to the underlying bone and you continue to walk on it uh, with, with a fractured underlying bone, uh, the lack of having firm support will end up causing the overlying cartilage to, to tear and you'll end up with a full thickness defect. But it's not uncommon to see bone injuries and the underlying bone and the cartilage intact. And now people, as we heard a couple of weeks ago from uh, Bert, Dre or Bert Mandelbaum, is that uh, uh, there's this the, something that's called the inside-out lesion, the bone-out lesion. Uh, and I think those are due uh, to these subchondral trabecular fractures uh, where the overlying articular cartilage is still intact. And if you catch those early on, it needs to realize that just because you've got edema in the subchondral bone does not mean the overlying articular cartilage is, is definitely abnormal. There are some people who will say, well, it's got to be grade four chondromalacia because I see edema in the underlying bone. Uh, that, that's really incorrect, and these bone-out lesions are very important because if you allow the trabecular bone to heal properly so that it becomes normal before you put a lot of weight bearing on it, you may be able to preserve the overlying articular cartilage. So it's important to recognize that those could be acute lesions uh, where uh, limited weight bearing may be important to allow conservation of the overlying articular cartilage. And we're hoping to do some studies in the next year or two to better confirm that. And there are some MR techniques where we can, they're not imaging techniques, they're actually more spectroscopic techniques where we can actually accurately evaluate uh, submicron level structures uh, like can occur in the subchondral bone that we may use in, in looking at those. Okay, move on. Let's see. Now, why, why don't we why don't we stop here? Okay, we'll we'll, we'll stop here and we'll continue.
uh, tomorrow on talking about articular cartilage. Okay. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.